yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. So, um, yeah, I work for a company called Container Solutions, and we are doing consulting and uh, research in the area. And also, obviously, cloud native applications, so everything that has been a topic. And the talk is titled Beyond 12 Factor Developing Cloud Native Applications. So, we probably first want to look at what uh, cloud native computing actually means, and for that, uh, we could turn to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. There's a foundation dedicated to that topic, it's a daughter of the Linux Foundation. It's comprised of um, a lot of large companies like Google, IBM, and Cisco, and also smaller ones like, like us, actually. Uh, if you want to know what cloud native computing is, we could, um, we could look at the mission statement of that foundation, and uh, they have it on the website. It's a lot of text, a lot of uh, fluffy words. So if we dig a bit deeper, we see that cloud native computing obviously deals with distributed Systems, containers, microservices, that modern stuff, ubiquity, dynamic management. But why do we need that? So how, why, why did we need to form a foundation to, to deal with it? And for that, we should look a bit at the history of computing. So in the beginning, you might remember the, the, the 90s, uh, haircuts and also a monolithic system running on bare metal physical infrastructure, really yep. big things. Um, and then uh, a few years later, the cloud came along, and the cloud made it possible to, to decompose your applications a lot easier into different services. Also use things like uh, TWs or other um, technologies like polyglot persistence. This trend has continued, and um, the, the trend today is uh, this thing called microservices to decompose it even more um, by um, using containers. Is that all you I continue. Yeah, um, especially using, using containers, which um, allowed it to uh, which allows you to, to distribute these microservices. Even to, to different clouds, if you want. So that's that's the latest fad that you use multi-cloud setups. And with um, each of these generations, the complexity of uh, these architectures increased, uh, I would say, by, by an order of magnitude. So you only had a few handful of servers in the beginning, and now you have probably thousands of containers. And uh, if you have a lot of moving parts, then obviously um, a lot of things can go wrong. So the, the mean time to failure. Uh, decreases, and that's where cloud native applications need to, to live. So, cloud native applications need to be developed in a way that they can deal with these dynamic environments where things come up and go down or fail uh, randomly, and where you also have probably latency between these different cloud uh, setups. And the common answer to that is um, we just do a 12 factor application. Never heard of that. A 12 factor application the term was uh, coined by Heroku, as far as I remember. Heroku was kind of a um, modern platform um, uh, founded in 2007. And uh, yeah, to be able to uh, develop applications on Heroku in a, in a nice way, they <coughs> published these 12 principles. That's why it's called 12 factor application. And, uh, Two most important principles are principle six and nine. So six is um, execute the app as stateless processes, and nine is disposability. So your application should consist of disposable, stateless. Services. Now you might ask yourself, how do I develop a kind of a database style application there? And the answer is you don't. The idea is that you use managed services, managed cloud services. Like uh, Amazon uh, relational database or, or something like that. <coughs> yeah, but that's not the only problem with um, with the statelessness because when you started the applications, uh, it, it was only about one application, and now with microservices, your application itself consists of a lot of small services, 
And even if they are stateless, um, you have the problem that um, a microservice based <coughs> system is always stateful. Even the individual services it is made up of are, are stateless. A good example here is um, any kind of cluster software that you have. So if you have any kind of cluster and want to upgrade it from version 1 to version, version 2, you have to do that gradually and very carefully and manage that, that upgrade. If you do it all by one, um, you, you break the service, which well, wouldn't be the case if it would uh, be um, fully stateless, right? So, as my colleague put it, a microservice system is stateful if all the constituent services are stateless. Yeah, that means these cloud native applications want to be orchestrated in some way. And there are three aspects of it. The first is uh, locality. Where should the individual components run? Um, so, for example, affinity rules or non-affinity rules services might not uh, be allowed to run on the same system for security reasons or for reliability reasons. They should probably run on different systems, um, things like that. Or you want to force them to run at a specific cloud provider or at a specific um, hardware node that has a fast storage. Then the second um, problem is lifecycle management. So what should the system do when it starts up, or when it stops, or when it fails? So you need to manage that kind of stuff. And um, the third one is elasticity. So what happens when uh, there are load spikes um, in, in, in one of your components, or if it's idling, so should it then self-destruct or not? And the typical answer to these um, problems is, hey, we use a scheduler and a resource manager, things like Kubernetes, uh, Mesos, and Docker Swarm. Um, yeah, and they actually work well for some of these aspects. So the, the locality <coughs> problem is solved. You have usually mechanisms like, like filters and rules where you can specify where stuff should end up or should not end up. And also lifecycle management is partly um, possible tell it to do some health check and spin it up or, or shut it down at some point. And sometimes even, uh, for example, Kubernetes, you can, you can do a bit of this elasticity things uh, using an autoscaler. But as soon as you need intimate knowledge about the application you're scaling, these models fail. Because it's just not enough. You can just cannot spin up um, or shut down randomly a database master. That, that won't work. You will have a very bad day uh, that, uh, if you don't manage it. And um, as I see, there are three options how you can, you can solve that problem. So the first is you, do, you write some software that does fully automated application management. Kind of you encode the brains of your system engineers into some software that from the outside manage these moving parts. Yeah, and then, well, there's all the, the, the cleanup and stuff, and the, the jobs that need to be done. So the se second option, a bit more advanced, is um, you write the software in a way that it is self-organizing. So like this flock of birds, um, it knows maybe only um, it's, it's, its own world and maybe a bit around, and uh, then can exhibit some kind of swarm intelligence. And the third option is you do something to totally crazy and um, write it as ephemeral event-triggered functions that live somewhere in the cloud and only, only <coughs> interact uh, via immutable state. So this model is obviously not um, useful for any kind of jobs, but it's, it's becoming um, a lot more popular in the recent, uh, recent months. Another interesting aspect of these three models is that um, the, the lifetime differs between these different models. Both the, the individual components have different lifetimes, so these functions only live a few milliseconds, maybe. And, um, but also the layout of the whole system has a different lifetime. So if you set up servers and, and applications manually that has a quite uh, long lifetime, how they interact, what the topology is, and if you have these ephemeral functions, you will never know um, how the connections between these functions were in the, in the last milliseconds. And if we look at these three models a bit more in depth, for this automatic application management, the smarts are here in the central management software. It knows the state of the whole system, it knows the state of the world, 
And two examples of that is uh, Mesos frameworks. So the Mesos scheduler, uh, you can write software for it. This is then called a framework. It's a bit of a stupid name, but it's, it's called like that. And for example, my colleagues have written um, one, of, one such framework to manage Elasticsearch clusters. So that framework knows the state of the whole cluster and then can intelligently decide what to do when, when something happens. Another example is uh, a software from YouTube called Vitesse, who does kind of the same for MySQL clusters. So as you see on this graph, it's, it's really centrally managed and you don't have to modify really the application and that you are managing with it because it's all done <coughs> by, the, by the scheduler. If you are a developer and want to play around with that model, we have a small tool um, open sourced called Minimesos where you can integrate um, that even your JUnit tests spins up ephemeral Mesos clusters and shuts them down again. And there's another small project um, called Mesos Data, which um, yeah, uh, relieves you from writing all the boilerplate code. So if you're into that kind of stuff, uh, go to minimesos.org and try it out. Uh, you can also do that with Kubernetes. It's not as widely done um, as of now, but it's, it's entirely possible. There's some example code from Kelsey Hightower from Google how to write a custom scheduling logic with Kubernetes. Yeah, the, the second model I mentioned were these self-organizing components. So the smarts are here in the components themselves. So if you have a legacy application, you would uh, put it in a way that the logic for the orchestration travels with um, the, the rest of the code. And um, yeah, these components then don't know usually the whole state of the complete system, maybe they know the state of their siblings, some other services they depend on, or only their own, that depends a bit on the use case. And uh, three examples of that is something called Container Pilot. It is a small project from Joint. Joint is also a cloud provider. They open sourced that. <coughs> I'll come to that later a bit. And then uh, quite recently, only this week, announced Habitat from Chef. Or Chef, you might know from, from uh, configuration management systems, they have now um, a system where you can convert your legacy applications or new applications into kind of self-organizing things. And also from Uber, the ride sharing platform, there's a, they have a project called RingPop. This is actually used whenever you call an, an Uber with your phone, um, the whole EU special stuff that is um, implemented uh, using this RingPop mechanism because they have a lot of um, different components distributed all over the world that, that, do, that use special computation where the next available car is. Yeah, and in, interestingly, these, um, these latter two use a gossip protocol, so there's no um, shared, uh, no central shared state anymore, they only uh, communicate via gossip. And such self organizing systems work with uh, very simple rules. So you might remember from your computer science class the uh, Conway's Game of Life. Um, it's, um, you, you program it by implementing a few very simple rules and then the system appears to be intelligent. So you're kind of simulating intelligence with, with very simple rules. We did um, a demo uh, with, with that model last year at the DockerCon. Um, it was a an attempt to write an auto-scaling system with very simple rules and no, no shared state at all. So the only two rules here are um, when a process receives a lot of traffic, so the processes are these, these bubbles here, um, they can spawn siblings. So when they say, oh, I'm receiving so much traffic, I can't handle it anymore, they can, can spawn a sibling. And uh, the second rule is that they have the concept of attrition. So they die at some point after a certain amount of time or after a certain amount of requests. And with these two simple rules, you can implement a completely breathing auto-scaling system without any, any central coordination. But coming to the more practical example of autopilot, um, or container pilot, how it's called now, this is actually something that you can easily use in your existing software. It's an, an open source agent, and instead of starting your actual service in, in the container you're developing, you would start that agent, and the agent then starts um, the service and manages its state. So it, it looks at the health 
um, of your service and it does some startup things uh, before it, it starts a service like downloading the latest database dump if you need it um, and does some cleanup things. And it also reacts <coughs> on changes from the outside. So you configure in that autopilot thing which other services you depend on and then on when, when any of these dependencies change, you can reconfigure the, the microservice process, reload it. Yeah, that's also called the autopilot pattern, they christened it like that. So there's, there's a web website, autopilotpattern.io, where you can read more about that. So on the last model is these ephemeral functions. So the, the components only react to events and rely on uh, the runtime they are, they are deployed in. So they are completely unaware of their surroundings. Um, Examples of that is the most popular, obviously, AWS Lambda, so Lambda functions, and uh, Google Cloud Functions is a competitor of that. And uh, I think last week, a company called Fabric8 released a software called Funktion for, for Kubernetes, where you can, can run that on your own Kubernetes cluster. My biggest problem with that model is that it requires a very heavyweight runtime. So that's, that reminds me a bit of Java Enterprise servers. So that makes it really hard to test um, test that kind of software because you only are thinking in atomic small functions, for example, small JavaScript functions. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, um, this is often also called serverless, so serverless architectures. I think uh, on the blog from Martin Fowler there was just an article about that uh, term yesterday. Pretty stupid name because obviously you need some servers to run that on, but well, the, it has stuck in that name. <coughs> There's even a, a, a web framework called the serverless framework <coughs> on serverless.com. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> another term they found is uh, function as a service recently, which is <coughs> a little bit better. And uh, yesterday on the train, I uh, just for the fun of it entered uh, infinite loop and lambda into Google and uh, found some interesting problems people have with that programming model. So that poor guy here um, accidentally created a, a loop and uh, created 200,000 files in his uh, Amazon S3 buckets. <coughs> yeah, now the question is what, uh, which of these three models are best? So what, what should you use? And uh, as always, there's no such thing as free lunch. There are compromises you need to make. And um, so f first of all, uh, if you standardize and abstract both the makeup of these individual components and also the variety of ways they can interact with each other, uh, you can create systems that, are, that exhibit a lot of autonomy and resiliency. So obviously, if you do everything manually, well, you don't have to standardize anything, um, but uh, yeah, you also don't, uh, are not really resilient or autonomous. So you're kind of limited by the brains of your engineers. And maybe you can extend it a bit with configuration management tools like, like Chef, Puppet, or Ansible, but, but that has its limits. So with a scheduler, you can um, go a bit further. You can yeah, uh, reach a higher level of uh, autonomy, um, but um, it, it's still limited in, in the scalability because the scheduler has to know the state of the complete system at all times. So at least in theory, you won't, you won't hit the limit in practice probably with most problems, but at least in theory, you are limited by that. And uh, obviously, you, you also have to standardize on a few things because you cannot encode the complete brain of your former system engineers inside software. That would be a lot of software you, you would need to write, so you have to standardize on certain ways components can interact. So with autonomous systems, self-organizing <coughs> self systems, um, you don't need any central state anymore, so you remove that single point of failure you have with a central scheduler, um, but you have to standardize even more. So as we saw in the, the container pilot example, the um, only allowed interaction kind of is these, these, these trigger hooks, in that case, that uh, manage the state of the system. And also, um, the, the individual artifacts in the container pilot example all need to look the same. So the scheduler, you can decide I'm putting a master node there and a slave node there and a helper node there 
um, with, with that model, it makes more sense that all components look the same and on startup they decide which role they want to assume. And then the maximum uh, available uh, uh, standardization and abstraction are obviously these atomic functions because it is just a piece of code. So you, you standardize on um, a function interface and uh, only communicate by passing immutable data between functions, either synchronous or, or asynchronous. Yeah, but that's, um, that scalability comes, of course, at a price. So, and, and the price is predictability and tunability. If you, if you um, manage your application manually, you can tune it as much as you want. You can decide exactly where you want to put it, in which server, in which rack, in which data center. And the more you use autonomous system, the less predictable they get. So um, that container pilot example is interesting. When we tried to demo it a few weeks ago, we ran into a lot of um, race conditions with it because unlike with a scheduler, um, it is undeterministic when things start up. So the scheduler could say, OK, I first want to start up the master, then I want to start up any, any primary or following nodes. And with such autonomous systems, uh, the components have to deal with these uncertainties. And as we saw in the poor uh, guy, the example from the poor guy who, who wrote that uh, loop function in his AWS Lambda, that is even less predictable. So you have to pay um, kind of a cognitive tax. If you want a scalable system with a lot of autonomy and resiliency, it gets a lot harder to reason about because of race conditions, because of a callback hell, um, yeah, because of runaway effects like, like in the game of life when you don't uh, tune the rules fine enough. So the question is which of these uh, models should you use if you want to, to develop cloud-native stateful applications? And um, my concluding opinion on this is all of them. And it depends really on, on the use case. And the nicest uh, analogy I found is the human body. So there are good use cases for central management. So reason and reasoning at movement, that's better managed centrally. Um, but it would be quite difficult for your spinal cord to manage the cell growth from your brain. So the cells in your body do that autonomously. And uh, that works quite well. Also, other things like knee-jerk reactions, you don't need uh, central management for that. So you should look at your, your application um, from that aspect and decide what, what works best for the, for the different components. It's like a bodybuilder. The brain decides I want to go to the gym, but then the muscle itself decides if it, if it wants to grow. Yeah, that's it. Um, if you want to learn more about cloud native computing, we have a nice conference in Amsterdam in uh, September, the Software Circus. Um, the, it's sponsored by the Cloud Native <coughs> Computing Foundation. Even Amsterdam is always worth a visit. So go to softwarecircus.io. It's, uh, I think, $300. Or Good. Thank you very much. Are there some questions, remarks? Uh, yes, please. Uh, one quick question. In the more automated, more autonomous uh, management model, how do you test solutions at the end of the day? Because that's what we felt was always what engineers struggle with, uh, with most. Yeah, that, that's, that's really an unsolved problem, I'd say. So that's really, also with, with Lambda, it's, it's really difficult to test these kind of things. So that's something we uh, all as, as research community need to work on. Yeah. 